Livestream Sports is brought to you by LivestreamUniverse.com. Get your daily live stream update with our show recommendations every weekday morning in video form on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash LivestreamUniverse. Monday is our summer season finale of Livestream Stars. We have Anthony Conklin, motivational keynote speaker and the man who interviewed Tony Robbins on Blab. That's Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern right here on Fire Talk. And now to today's guest. Nobody covers college football quite like Mark Rogers online. Mark owns 24 years of experience in various aspects of broadcast, journalism, and production. He's a three-time Associated Press Mississippi Sportscaster of the Year. Mark has worked as an anchor, host, reporter, producer, and play-by-play voice at ESPN, WCBI, and WNCO. He also has 11 years of productions, operations, management experience, at ESPN and Mark also displays his skills on his YouTube channel, Mark Rogers TV, which houses over 2,400 college football videos with opinion and analysis featuring an ever expanding network of bloggers and broadcasters across the country. And Mark recently passed the 500,000 view Mark. So congratulations, Mark on that. And of course, Mark is the co-host of BTS live with our good friend, Marty McPadden. You can catch that Thursday nights, at uh, btslive.com, 8 p.m. Eastern. You guys are taking a little bit of a, a late summer break, but you'll be back September 15. And other than that, nothing much going on. Yeah, not huh? a whole lot going on, <laughs> Ross. If you want to throw some work my way, I- I'm sure I've got plenty of time to <laughs> knock some things out for you. Well, welcome. It's it's great to have you on the show and uh, looking forward to the upcoming college football season. But let's talk first about your YouTube channel, um, because you've done an amazing job covering a niche market, which is, you know, really gearing your broadcast to the passionate college football fan who really wants to know what's going on with their team, their league and around the, the country. How did you get started doing that and how how has it's been growing the well, channel. Ross, as you it. well know, it, it's a big mountain to climb, and hopefully I'm not even, even close to being halfway up the mountain. So we're just getting started and seeing a lot of traction recently. So you kind of uh, alluded to my background, which is uh, being a huge sports fan, being uh, interested in writing and broadcasting. I majored in broadcast journalism at Kent State University, so I immediately hit the pavement for a traditional broadcast job. So we're talking way back in 1991. Uh, so I got a job at WNCO. I was, despite, and this is a long story in and of itself, despite telling the general manager and the news director during what was kind of an informal interview, being interviewed when I didn't even know it because I didn't know that there was a news anchor opening telling them that I despised news, that I love sports. I had to go into sports, (laughs) that I hated news. And the next thing they said was, well, we've got a news anchor opening. Well, when you're when you're starving and you're just out of college, you'll take anything to get your face on the air. And so I, of course, jumped at that and, and and later asked them, why would you hire a guy who just said he despised news as a news anchor? And they said, well, uh, you finished up the interview and you read the teleprompter better than anyone else. So uh, I, I was there. <laughs> hey, talent wins out. So much for being pat. We want to hire people who are passionate. <laughs> no, actually, talent wins out, right? <laughs> so, so it worked out, Ross. It was great. So in addition to the news anchoring and reporting for a very small station in Ashland, Ohio, that was a mega country music station. So that's where my voice was heard more was doing play by play on their FM station for ashland college and high school sports i then moved on to wcbi in mississippi we covered sec football like you can imagine like nothing else just Mm -hmm. that was full throttle all the time high school football and old miss mississippi state and alabama were right in the neighborhood so we covered all three of those so my sports calendar was littered with college world series appearances and ncaa tournaments and going to a final four in 1996 covering bowl games and big games and It was a a whole lot of fun and a great experience in covering big, sizable matchups every week, Uh, excuse me, in the SEC. So that was a whole lot of fun. I was sports director there for six years. It taught me not just how to hone and refine my broadcasting skills, but also how to run a sports department because I had uh, a weekend sports anchor under me. I had a bureau of three people that I could access and... uh, facilitate to cover sports in another part of the state 
and it really taught me organizational skills, how to be a leader, how to uh, uh, lead people and communicate and, and the, the art of communication and effective communication and organization and planning, uh, planning trips and, and forethought in regards to running a department. So I left uh, WCBI in 2000. I had about a year and a half hiatus out of broadcasting per se. I went to ESPN. That's where I met Marty, our good friend, Marty McPadden, that we reference from time to time. Mm -hmm. And I worked with Marty for 13 or 14 years and uh, got into management at ESPN. So somehow my name got around and in regards to my background and experience and somebody involved in uh, the digital platform at ESPN, which has really expanded and grown and flourished. And that's really where that company needs to head and, and knows that. Uh, back then, it was the wild, wild west. You know, they were just throwing stuff on digital platforms right. and they had a mobile phone and they didn't know exactly how this was going to work out. But at the time, so the the guy that ran that department, he somebody put in his ear and I never found out who this individual was. I would love to thank them and shake their hand, they said, you, you need to contact Mark Rogers. He's right here and he knows sports and he can broadcast. So you need to grab him. So I got a phone call from him. So he's right across campus. And so I started to do work on ESPN.com. So just picture coming in on a busy NBA, NHL, Major League Baseball night and sitting down and saying, okay, I've got to cover all 15 of these games or maybe the overlap of NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL in the spring. And uh, guys would just knock out. And of course, they wanted to post this content as soon as possible. You know, if people are looking for those Angels Yankees highlights right when the game's over, they want to be able to jump online and not have to wait 15 minutes. Uh, so at right. that point, uh, I would go in on a shift, I would knock out an intro. So I would had to, you, you learn how to do quality work in a short period of time because time is of the essence in what we do. And so quality writing, but I couldn't sit there and think about it. I had to knock out 15 leads like that because then I had to go to the green room. I had to, I had to post them and, and um, have those shots so that they would have an anchor lead into the highlights package. So then it was waiting around and waiting for games to end and trying to track and keep track of 15 to 25 games that were going on and what was the progress of these games and which one was going to end first and what was I going to say about it. And then somebody would edit the highlights and they'd get the shot sheet on my desk minutes after the game had concluded. And then you know the drill in regards to you've got a shot sheet that says, First inning, Derek Jeter single to right, Yankees lead one nothing. But hey, if you're just going to read a shot sheet, then what good are you? Uh, so you need to embellish <laughs> and, and use your your God given ability and and some of the the skills I had developed in regards to reading highlights. So I relied on my nine years of experience at the aforementioned two stations in regards to reading highlights and and being able to take a shot sheet that's nothing but information, but adding my little shtick to it. And uh, so that was a whole lot of fun. So the issue there, Ross, was I've got a management job at ESPN. They're calling me day of or day before, night before, and wanting me to be on ESPN.com. And there was a bit of a conflict there. And fortunately, I, I was being paid. That was very nice. But um, the... Uh, the day job kind of won out, uh, and unfortunately, that kind of dried up in regards to opportunities because I had to uh, turn that down most of the time. And they've gone in different direction in regards to how they package the highlights right. in a more efficient way uh, for folks. Let me just interrupt sure. you for one second because I think that's very forward-looking, though, on ESPN's part at that time. And, I mean, now they're doing so much content all the time that they may not need to. But at that time, to be taking – uh, you know, fresh content for online market and saying, how can we use it to enhance what our overall coverage is instead of just waiting till sports center and then popping some clips on, 
right? So, I mean, they really, I mean, it sounds like it was a very full plate you had, obviously. But, uh, I mean, that seems that seems like very forward-looking is the way we look at social media and digital and all that kind of stuff now that they were kind of really ahead of the game. And, Ross, that. to give you a little context, this was 2008. So this was eight years ago right. uh, that I was doing this. And at the time, I'll bring Marty into the conversation again. Uh, Marty and I were working together in network operations. Uh, he knew something about my background in broadcast. But so I'm in a different building on campus doing this on certain nights and Marty's doing the management thing. And so I started to send him clips and say, hey, look at this. And and he was like, man, I didn't know you could do this. I, I didn't know that uh, this was your skill set. And uh, he was watching these clips and he'd respond and say, you know, you really need to be doing this all the time. You need to be doing this. This is this is your passion. This is what you love to do. This is what you have experience right. in and and have a skill for. And so he was the one that really encouraged me to embark on what I'm doing right now. Uh, it not being 1975 or 1985 where you need the big plant and you need the the, the big equipment and million dollars uh, of equipment to to launch anything. He's like, you know, those days have gone by. So you need to get started on this and. And that really gave me the impetus to start first a YouTube channel, just knocking out videos and throwing them out there. Uh, very raw, very uh, in the moment. Uh, as Marty likes to say, I would hold a, a 3G iPhone in front of me. That's what I had at the time. And, and this was probably in the days of iPhone 5s were probably the ones that were the latest uh innovation so i had like a 3g and i would just hold this thing ross in front of me because i'm not a real technical operational guy uh manager and network <laughs> operations but not necessarily the mr technical operational and i didn't even know how to trim the video at that point ross i would just click it as soon as i wanted to talk and click it when i was done and i'm standing there so my first hundred videos are simply me looking into an iphone and trying to time the the function of the start and the finish uh <laughs> to knock out these college football videos but as we like to tell people you got to start somewhere and you got to you got to right. move forward you, you're not going to start with the finished product so start somewhere um wow that's uh, that's some amazing um journey you had and when you look at, at your youtube channel now and now your stuff is much more polished and you have all sorts of guests on um how did you I mean, how did you build up that whole network of people that you, you know, both on the air to interview, but also as sources for what's going on in the different areas? Because you really cover it at a depth that that I haven't seen anybody else covering college football exclusively online at that at that level. What's funny is some people ask me from time to time, Ross, why do you call your channel your platform Mark Rogers TV? And um, I. I I'm telling you, I'm not an egomaniac. I, I just, I had no idea where I was going to take this. Uh, so right. I thought, you know, I want to brand myself because I don't know if I'm going to, I'm a big major league baseball fan. I'm an NFL fan. So I have other interests. I have political interests and some other things. So I didn't know exactly where I was going to take this from day one. And then college football just seemed like a natural fit in regards to my passion which is most important. I think you would agree with that in regards right. to uh, giving uh, content creators a, a lean in one direction toward your passion, toward your interest. But at the same time, it was just ready made for debate. And, and that's what engages people is the discussion and the debate. The NFL, there's no debate over who's going to make the playoffs. Major League Baseball, the same thing. We, we don't have to debate it. The standings are going to conclude uh, uh, and and tell us uh, at the conclusion of the regular season who's going to make the playoffs but in college football especially at that time with the bcs but even with the iteration into the college football playoff there's debate who should make it because it's not totally objective uh and then the the it's probably unrivaled in this country you'd probably have to go to europe and 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 go to soccer to to rival the passion and the rabid fan bases with college football uh, even though the NFL is more popular on a, on a grand scale. So that was my determination on niching down to college football. And I got to say, Ross, there have been times when I've thought it would probably be better for my business to niche down even more and pick a conference 
That's mm-hmm. probably the easiest way to do it. I wouldn't necessarily need to go down to one team, although, as you know, the major powerhouses out there have plenty of fans that uh, content creators can go after Ohio State or USC or Alabama right. and certainly thrive. But I just love it too much, and I love the diversity of the grand scale and the national map that right. I just haven't been able to do that. I just can't push myself to do that. So I think ultimately, hopefully, that in the long run, that's going to benefit me because I'm going to have contacts and followings all over the country. And hopefully they're going to kind of piece together as opposed to saying, I'm just covering the SEC. And uh, while that might be a short term, uh, more success driven strategy that uh, I, I just love college football across the board too much to do that. So, right. If you check out, I don't know, I'm guessing the first 500 to 1,000 videos, it was exclusively, hey, just me. I'm talking about everybody. I'm trying to be an expert on everyone. Now, that's difficult to do. I think I pulled it off to some degree. Uh, There weren't too many detractors out there. Um, But at some point, I, I realized for so many different reasons, from the standpoint of having more diverse content and having more quality content, hey, if I'm covering there's 128 teams playing division one FBS football, let's say more in the 65 to 70 range in terms of power programs. Can I cover them as well as contacting the Nebraska guy to talk Nebraska football? He's the Nebraska guy. Uh, So it was a decision I made from a content standpoint that, Hey, I need, um, I need help here to really get to the nuts and bolts to reach the hardcore fans. There's no way I can know enough about Nebraska football to be credible for those people. But it had more to do with the branding and the networking as well. Um, you know, you help me out. I help you out, hopefully. We we have a network right. built within a number of groups that we have where we help each other. We retweet stuff. We We give people the nudge to say, hey, check out this person. He's really good at what he does. You can't do it alone and just say, I'm going to produce videos and 100,000 people are going to start watching these videos because I'm so good. It doesn't work that way. You need people and you learn from people. I have learned so much from watching people like yourself and Marty and Stephen Haywood Mm -hmm. and a number of people and seeing what they do uh, from a. For me, it's less from a broadcasting standpoint, even though, hey, I am <laughs> I'm far from perfect and have much to learn there as well. But more from the standpoint of branding, marketing, social media strategies, all those things I have learned uh, and have much more to learn, but have learned so much from, from guys like you. So the networking part uh, to, to talk to content creators out there is crucial. It has to happen. Right. What do you see um, when you look at people covering sports, say, through YouTube channels? What do you see out there that you say, okay, that person's really doing it well? Or what are you seeing that that works? People who want to find another niche, whether it's in sports or even in, you know, in tech or whatever. Like, what do you think works on YouTube? Because obviously YouTube is different from television. It's different from from just live streaming, grabbing your phone, and I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about live and interact with the comments. It's kind of a unique platform in a lot of ways, right? Because it's pre, it's record, it's mostly recorded stuff. Even if you do it live, you you have it. It's going to sit on the channel. People are going to watch it at at different times. What makes sort of a good broadcast for that platform? Well, the internet has been a double-edged sword. So in regards to providing a platform for anyone, that's the obvious plus. The The downside is you have to weed through a lot of garbage to get to some decent <laughs> stuff. Uh, everyone has a platform. Uh, so I'll speak to audio and video, but also the written word. And this is probably what gets me a little bit more as I go through a lot of And I'll speak to college football because that's what I'm researching from people who it would be like if you told me today, Ross, write an article on the Georgia Bulldogs. I could do that off the top of my head. It wouldn't be very good uh, because I hadn't researched them. Uh, It could be good three days from now, but it wouldn't be very good right now. So there's a lot of people just talking the obvious and the cliched and the generic just to get stuff done and get it out there. 
And so I think people need to look at themselves and think, okay, what are my strengths? Am I funny? Am I quirky and interesting from a different aspect? Do I want this to be just hardcore nuts and bolts somewhere where people can go for their, again, college football information and get the, the take that's a straight take? We're going to break down the offensive line unit for this season, and that's what I'm going to do. So I, I think people need to know, first of all, they need to honestly assess who they are and, and play to their strengths. And so I want to know when I go to a certain site or a certain person that they're going to deliver consistency and it's going to be true to, to them, if that makes sense. Right. No, that's, that's, that's very important. And um, you give such great advice as well on, on BTS live with Marty for people who are starting out and as broadcasters and you, you notice both, the good things that people are doing and also the mistakes. What do you think are some small things, whether somebody's doing a live stream, they're doing a recorded video, small, s some small steps that, you know, newer broadcasters can take that can make a big difference without needing expensive equipment, without, you know, without breaking the bank, but just in what they're doing in front of the camera with their voice and with their content, you think people could do to, to, to quickly improve their game. All right. To get the easy technical one bullet point out of the way, clean audio and video is a must. It's important. Even if you don't have fancy music graphics and don't have the bells and whistles, you know, it's the, it's the whole phone game in regards to transmission. And if you can't hear the other person or you have to work to listen to them, they could be the great orator and knowledge of that particular topic and and if it's just difficult there are just so many options out there that people aren't going to put up with difficult transmission so get that cleared out and, and get that set and make sure that that's rock solid in regards to audio and video and then after that and that's something that i continue to stress and fight through myself so I, I need to make iterations in that in that realm myself but if we're talking strictly about content and broadcasting I think that people need to be conversational, but you need to have an idea of what you're talking about and have right. a formula as to how you're going to express yourself and make your point. So you have those people that are a little too regimented and read off a script. But what I see more often is the person that thinks I can ramble for 10 or 12 minutes and, and I'm really interesting. So people are going to listen to me for 10 or 12 <laughs> minutes. Well, <laughs> None of us are as interesting as maybe we think we are. So if you watch my videos, especially my solo videos where I'm, I'm on by myself and, and driving a point, you know, I'm breaking down the Georgia offense. Here it is. Um, there, there's a structure to what I'm saying, whether I'm debating a point and trying to bring you to a conclusion or I'm just reviewing the Georgia offense. Um, speak in bullet points and be concise. Great communicators uh, don't ramble on for a long time or write volumes of, of copy. They're usually more condensed. Right. Uh, sometimes I'm asked to, and I, I enjoy writing. I wish I was a better writer. I'm a good writer. I Maybe I have some potential to be a little bit better, but I just don't do a whole lot of writing these days. I do a lot of procedural and technical writing at work. And people bring a lot of writing to me to check and edit and so forth. And people that don't know much about writing, they assume that when I get a hold of it, it's going to be longer. But no, it's, it's most likely right. going to be shorter <laughs> because I know how to spit out in 14 words what it took you 38 words to say, uh, unless you're incomplete and I've got to add more information to it. So I, I think when people can be concise, that's very important was still making sure that you're being thorough with your topic and not leaving important points out. Uh, and then also understand that for as engaged as some people are in watching a video, how many people are out there, they're watching TV, they're watching video, they're reading something, they're looking at their phone, they're not just locked in on you. So you need to realize that if somebody comes away with one point, maybe two out of what you said for eight minutes, you've pretty much done a pretty good job. So make sure that you're emphasizing certain points and you kind of punch them up 
a um, lot of people get nervous. They talk like an air conditioner and, you know, it's just kind of humming, humming along duh, 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 and nothing, nothing really <laughs> jumps out at you and it all kind of gets lost right, because they're right. trying to spit out everything as fast as they possibly can. So you need to emphasize what the most important points to your topic are, kind of punch those up, give them a little emphasis, give them a little energy. Right, right. Is See, now, if I'm if I'm a, a fan, like you gave the Georgia line example, if I'm a hardcore Georgia football fan, no amount of time is going to be long. Like, if you wanted to go on for two hours breaking down Georgia, I'm going to be sitting there all years. I can't get enough of it, right? Um, but when you're doing YouTube videos for, let's say, a more general audience that isn't so passionate about the topic, what do you think is the sweet spot for the length of a YouTube video. I hear this all the time and I think radio probably has it right. And that's why there are seven and eight minute segments to most uh, radio segments. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of people incorporate that, that rule because, you know, you can have a decent discussion, whether, whether that's yourself making the points or you're, you're having a conversation, but you can, you know, that that's, that's a decent length. It just feels right. That doesn't mean you can't have a great, obviously people are producing podcasts that are 45 minutes to an hour and have very uh, passionate, uh, engaged audiences. But if you're, if you're breaking down a, a very specific subject, like the Oklahoma defensive backfield. Yeah. I, I don't, I can't imagine too many people are going to listen to that for an hour, but, uh, seven or eight minutes. Right. Right. And you know, um, I, I've never worked in, in TV, so um, doing video and all that kind of thing is, is all new to me. Um, our, our TV segments tend to be even tighter than, than radio segments or, or not, because I feel like um, even in doing my updates that I do, and they range from, you know, about three and a half minutes to five minutes, I, I want to get them shorter and shorter if I can. And that's I'll re-record it if it's not as tight as I want it to be, because I feel like, you know, if it was two and a half minutes, that would be better than if it was three and a half minutes, unless there's a reason that it should be longer, right? Like if I'm including a clip from a, an event or something like that, that's, that might be different, but I feel like everybody's attention span and, and even more so on Facebook than on YouTube, people's ex- attention span is short. There's a lot of distractions online. Um, and so for something that's sort of more in, just giving the information of the day or whatever, I got to get to it quickly and, and get done quickly. Yeah. I noticed when I first started having guests on, I was way too long winded in getting to them. Uh, I think instead of just saying, Hey, this is Mark Rogers, Mark Rogers TV. We've got John Smith on from Michigan insider. Take it away, John. Obviously you want to give some sort of, you want to have a unique open, where you're saying, hey, Michigan really struggled on the offensive front last year. They bring back three starters, blah, 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 and we bring in whatever. You, you, you need to give it some personality or some change up. But at the same time, I was taking 45 and 50 seconds to get to the guest. And I still do that from time to right. time. So don't please don't uh, analyze my last uh, 100 videos because you'll see me still do I, I do it too, as you, as you heard today. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's no set rule. That's hard and fast for every situation. Uh, This this is just very general, but I would like to get it to the guest in 20 to 25 seconds if we're talking about a five to 10 minute video just to get it to them. They're the reason we're doing this video is I'm having them on. I'm tapping their knowledge. So I want to be able to provide something, not just uh, I've almost become Ross uh, too much of a facilitator. I think Uh, I'm trying to get back to. Uh, and, and what's really interesting, I don't know what this says because my network has been phenomenal. I have probably 75 to 80 people that I can contact at any time and they'll jump on with me. People from SB Nation and Bleacher Report and inside the ACC and all sorts of places. Uh, what's, what's interesting, though, is that people became attached to this is the conclusion I'm going to draw attached to me and how I approach topics because I get more views when I tap these other platforms for obvious reasons, they place it on their platform. I've got a big platform that's helping me out. I get more engagement and comments when it's just me. Uh, 
that hmm. that's seen and it, it's not even close uh you can draw whatever conclusion do you think in part i think well do you think in part that's because you're a really good interviewer and people maybe don't want to disrupt what's going on like they're just listening to it like mark's gonna ask all the questions that i need to ask so i'll just listen whereas when you're on by yourself they say let me let me engage let me help out a little bit let me leave a comment let me contribute to the discussion but sometimes you're watching a show and i know that that i i've made this mistake sometimes is i don't stop and take a breath when i have a good guest on um like i i really should be bringing people in to ask you questions or getting questions in the chat. And I just find I get so caught up in our conversation that sometimes I forget that. And I, I, so it's like a double-edged sword, right? On one hand, you're good at interviewing. On the other hand, maybe that makes it less participatory for other people. Like if you were doing a talk radio show, you'd always be, okay, you give out the phone number. We're going to take your calls at this time or whatever. <laughs> but, but on a show like this where it, it's more free-flowing, it's very easy to forget, oh, you know, maybe I should get the audience involved a little bit. Yeah, more. and that's something as a guy that came from traditional broadcasting where there was absolutely no feedback. We had to hire some company for right. $100,000 to come in <laughs> to tell us what people thought of us, and we, we did that a few times. And it was always interesting to hear the, the feedback uh, when it came to viewer focus groups, but, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a conversation. This isn't me talking to you. Right. So I, I hope I, even though I tend to, I think my, my nature is to, to, to swing and lean back into traditional broadcasting and say, Hey, listen to me. This is what I have to say about this, that, um, there's no question it works much better for, for ultimate success, but also in terms of the interest and just the, the fun to, to have a conversation with people. Well, listen, um, thank you so much. It's great having you on. Um, you, yeah, you bring so much to college nice. football and broadcasting, and you've been so great to all of us in the live streaming community, sharing your knowledge. And uh, I wish you all the success on, on your network and look forward to continuing the conversation on BTS Live and elsewhere. 